the NBA, we think about what-if scenarios a lot. Like, what if Len Bias hadn't died before his rookie season? Or what if James Harden wasn't traded from the Oklahoma City Big Three? However, one what-if that is rarely ever mentioned is, what if Maurice Stokes didn't have a career-ending injury back in 1958? Now, some of you may be thinking, who even is Maurice Stokes? And that's a little bit unfortunate because he was set to have a great future in the NBA and could have gone down as one of the all-time legends of the game. But then it all vanished, leaving us with one of the biggest what-ifs of all time. Join me as I delve into the career of the forgotten legend, Maurice Stokes. These are some quotes by three Celtics legends and Hall of Famers who at some point or another either played or coached against Maurice Stokes. He was described as a player far ahead of his time as he was a 6 foot 7, 235 pound man built of pure muscle. An athletic specimen who also had incredible vision for a big in a time where big men were regulated to standing in the post and waiting for a pass to come their way. However, that doesn't mean that he wasn't still an incredible rebounder and defensive-minded power forward, as in his three seasons in the NBA, he grabbed 3,492 rebounds, which led the league for that time span. Who was in second place? Bob Pettit, a man that stood two inches taller than Stokes and a Hall of Famer. And then third place was Dolph Shays, another man who was taller than Stokes and yet another Hall of Famer. So how could a player that was this dominant be so forgotten among NBA legends? I mean, seriously, before watching this video, have you ever even heard of this guy? I didn't think so. That's why I'm here to tell you. For Maurice Stokes, it all started when he was born on June 17, 1933. He was one of four children in his home, including his twin sister. He grew up in Rankin, Pennsylvania, a town just outside of Pittsburgh. Early in his life, he actually moved into Pittsburgh and later attended Westinghouse High School, where this is where his career begins. However, he didn't really make too much of an impact as he was coming off the bench for his first two years, which is pretty common for most high school freshmen and sophomores, but we're talking about an NBA player here. A Hall of Famer, in fact. This later changed when he helped lead the team to two straight championships in 1950 and 1951. With high school coming to an end, Stokes only did have about 10 offers from Division I schools from around the country as he was a fairly unknown prospect coming out of high school, but he ended up choosing St. Francis, a small Division I school just outside of Pittsburgh and less than two hours away from Stokes' hometown. He averaged an incredible 22.4 points per game across his college career, but really broke out in his senior season as he averaged 27 points per game and a mind-boggling 26.2 rebounds per game. His efforts led to an NIT berth for St. Francis, where Stokes played even better, scoring 43 points in an overtime loss in the semifinals to Dayton. He was so dominant in this tournament that the NIT committee decided to just say, screw it, Stokes, you win the MVP, even though he didn't even win the title. This is the only time that this has ever happened in NIT tournament history, by the way. Stokes finished his college career as easily the greatest player in St. Francis history, as he is the second leading scorer all time for a single season and for a single game. He also leads the Red Flash in all-time rebounds. By a lot. Leading second place by almost 500 rebounds. That's almost 38% of the amount of rebounds that the second place guy accumulated in his entire career. The records don't just stop there, as he also holds a single season record for rebounds as well as the most for a single game with 39. Just imagine playing a game and your opponent drops 39 on you, but not just 39 points, 39 rebounds. You may just have to quit at that point, honestly. As he shattered records, became an All-American, and was voted MVP of the NIT, Stokes' name gained a lot of traction post-college. He had an offer waiting for him with the Harlem Globetrotters, but ultimately decided he wanted to take his talents to the NBA. So when the 1955 NBA draft came along, he was selected second overall to the Rochester Royals. 
There, he made an immediate impact with the team, as in his first game, he posted a stat line of 32 points, 20 rebounds, and 8 assists. Mann's almost posted a triple-double in his first game. It was at that point that the NBA knew they had their next great superstar. Stokes went on to have a fantastic rookie season, winning Rookie of the Year in the process by averaging 17 points, a league-leading 16.3 rebounds per game, just narrowly edging out Bob Pettit and one of only eight players who averaged 10-plus rebounds a game, and 4.9 assists, where he finished top 10 in the league as well as above every other big man in the league as he was the only big to average over four a game. Which again, a big man who had the vision of a guard was unheard of during this period of time in the NBA. He really did pave the way for future big men who also had really good vision, such as Nikola Jokic in the future. Unfortunately, while Stokes was awesome, the Royals were not, as their roster really wasn't built for contending that year as their best players other than Stokes were Bobby Wanzer, a five-time All-Star and a Hall of Famer. However, he wasn't too much of an offensive threat throughout his career, peaking out at about 16 points per game. But he was in his second-to-last season of his career, last as an All-Star, and only averaged about 10.4 points per game, and was clearly declining as a player. They also had Jack Twyman, a six-time All-Star and Hall of Famer, but he was only in his rookie season, averaging about 14 points per game, and wasn't even an All-Star yet. More on Twyman later. And a bunch of role players who really just weren't great. As a result of this, the Royals finished the year with a 31-41 and record, which was the worst in the league. However, to look at the bright side of all this, though, since they were the worst team in the league, The Royals were awarded with the first pick in the 1956 NBA Draft, where the top prospect was future top 10 player of all time, Bill Russell. However, the Royals decided to pass on Russell to select Cy Hugo Green, an average guard who played nine seasons in the league, averaging nine points, four rebounds, and three assists over the length of his career, but obviously not even close to the same level as Bill Russell who the Royals passed on for a number of reasons. Most notably, rumor has it that Walter Brown, the owner of the Celtics at the time, told Rochester that if they passed on Russell, he would send the ice capades to Rochester for a week. Walter Brown also was the president of the ice capades and had the power to do this. Whether or not this is true is unconfirmed, as Brown never publicly spoke about the incident before its death in 1964, And honestly, this is a topic that could really warrant a video on its own. But whatever happened ended up being a terrible decision that would haunt the Royals roster forever. Regardless, Stokes' second season was fairly the same statistically as he put up numbers of 15.6 points, 17.4 rebounds, and 4.6 assists per game, while still being one of the best, if not the best, defender in the league. The Royals unfortunately still sucked, finishing with the same 31-41 record as they did in the previous season. And in the offseason, it was announced that the team would be moving to Cincinnati because Rochester simply did not meet the population size, nor really have the TV market to really sell the team. With the team now in Cincinnati, the Royals wanted to make a real stride for being a good basketball team for once as they traded the first overall pick to Minneapolis in exchange for all-star big man Clyde Lovelett. The team was ready to win and they didn't prove in that year as they did finish the year with two more wins than in the previous season and they actually made the playoffs for the first time in the Stokes era. Individually speaking, Stokes had his best season yet, averaging a career high in points, rebounds, and assists per game. He finished third in the league in assists per game for the second consecutive season, and second in the league in rebounds and defensive win shares, only trailing Bill Russell. And when you're second only behind Bill Russell, you know you're in good company at that point. With everything finally clicking into place for the Royals, it appeared as though nothing would stop their rise to the top. That was until March 12, 1958, In the last game of the season against the horrible Minneapolis Lakers, Stokes had possession of the ball and was driving through the lane when he collided with one of the Lakers players. 
Stokes was awkwardly hit in the air, which caused him to land directly on his head on the hardwood court. He was knocked unconscious for several minutes when the team doctors finally revived him with smelling salts. And believe it or not, Stokes actually returned to the game and led Cincinnati to a 7-point victory while putting up 24 points and 19 rebounds in the process. Due to this, the injury wasn't seen as all that serious and Stokes suited up for his first and unfortunately last playoff game three days later in a game one against the Detroit Pistons. The Pistons blew out the Royals 100-83 and Stokes didn't really play up to par, only scoring about 12 points on 3 for 12 from the field with 15 rebounds and 2 assists in 39 minutes of play. However, the real issue wasn't until the Royals flew back to Cincinnati when Stokes became seriously ill. So sick to the point that Stokes told his teammates, I feel like I'm going to die. He had been suffering from a seizure. When the plane landed, Stokes was taken to a nearby hospital where he received treatment for his condition. He was unable to move his body for weeks as he laid in a coma. Stokes was diagnosed with post-traumatic encephalopathy, also known as a form of CTE, which is a brain injury that damages the motor control center. Stokes' injury was so severe that it single-handedly ended his career at just 24 years old. It completely paralyzed his whole body and limbs, and he was unable to even speak when he first gained consciousness in the hospital. To make things even worse, than they already were, in 1958, the NBA didn't have a pension plan, so when the Royals cut Stokes from their roster, he no longer had any income coming in to pay for his hospital bills. Not that his $15,000 salary he was receiving in those days were going to pay for his $100,000 a year hospital bills anyway, though. Stokes' family also did not have enough money to keep him alive. This is the point where Jack Twyman comes back into the story. Twyman and Stokes knew each other growing up in the same city and would play each other on local courts in Pittsburgh, but they went their own ways after high school, only to be reunited when they were both drafted by the Royals in 1955. Twyman went on to have a Hall of Fame career playing all 11 of his years with the Royals, leading to six All-Star appearances and two All-NBA selections. As for Twyman and Stokes, they would develop a friendship that would last for the rest of their lives, as Twyman decided to become Stokes' legal guardian so he could help pay for his bills. But even Twyman couldn't pay his bills entirely, so he tried to scrap every little bit that he could, but Stokes was running out of time. Eventually, he decided to organize an exhibition game that featured some of the top NBA players, including Bob Cousy, Dolph Shays, Will Chamberlain, and many, many more. This later became an annual event known as the Stokes Games. The event did well and raised enough money to pay for Stokes' hospital bills, and after many years of grueling physical therapy, Stokes was able to regain the ability to utter a few sounds, scarcely move some joints, and even walk a few feet with assistance. He mostly communicated by typing out what he wanted to say, and he even went on to write an autobiography that, unfortunately, was never published. However, in 1970, Maurice Stokes suffered a heart attack that was too severe to come back from, and he died at the age of 36. So while we never really got to see Stokes play into his prime years, he still was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2004, which is pretty shocking considering he's only played in the league for three seasons. And that's the least amount of years anybody has played in the NBA and still made it to the Hall of Fame. Well, with the exceptions of guys like Louis Dampier, who played three NBA seasons but nine ABA seasons, and Al Servi, who only played four NBA seasons, but he also played five seasons in the NBL, which was one of the two pro basketball leagues available to join before the NBA even existed. As for Jack Twyman, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1983 and passed away in 2012 at the age of 78 due to complications from blood cancer. Nevertheless, Maurice Stokes and Jack Twyman's legacies continues to this day because in 2013, a year after Twyman passed, the NBA announced the introduction of the Twyman Stokes Teammate of the Year Award, which recognizes the player that embodies the league's ideal teammate that season. Chauncey Billups was the inaugural winner, and last season Damian Lillard of the Portland Trailblazers won that award. 
And that's where our story ends. Stokes should have been remembered as one of the best players of that era, but instead, we were left with this. So, what if Maurice Stokes had not been injured and went on to have a healthy career? What would that mean for the NBA in the generation succeeding? Well, I can't really predict too far into the future due to just so many butterfly effects unfolding, but most likely the Royals would have been too good in 1960 and wouldn't have been able to draft Oscar Robertson. And if that doesn't happen, other events change as well, such as other teams' draft needs, but it's too hard to predict exactly what happens. However, one thing I do know is that the NBA would look entirely different had Maurice Stokes not had his career-ending neck injury. I hope you guys enjoyed this story. My name is T-Pointer, and I'll see you guys next video.